Welcome to the Sunset Safari, where the Impala are all ready for the show. And, well, so are the Oxpackers. My name is Taylor McCurdy, and on camera with me today is VM. And welcome again to all of you. For those of you that have never joined us on one of these live and interactive safaris, hold on tight, strap in, have a beverage in your hand, and get ready to ask lots of questions. Hashtag Safari Live is one way you can ask us questions. The other way is, of course, to talk to us via the YouTube chat. Desperately trying to keep my eyes open in the blazing heat. Now, it's exceptionally warm today. Brent is going to have a lot of fun uh, walking about as it is 32 degrees Celsius. 89 degree Fahrenheit. I actually thought it was going to be hotter after the bushwalk on the sunrise safari. I had to cool myself down with a bit of water spraying. That won't be ha ha happening this afternoon because I have my flask, so it's nice and ice cold, so it can just cool me down internally today. And coffee. What coffee, Nikki? Nikki's directing the show today. She says, and coffee. Oh, no, that coffee. Okay, now I wasn't going to tell everybody that story, but now that you've brought it up. So, I had a couple of things that happened to me this morning. Karma, possibly for squirting water onto Tristan. The first one was, we ended the show and I drove home on the hood of the car and I sprawled out, arms back, laid back, feet up. And it's on, it's on Instagram if you'd like to watch it. And um, basically what had happened, Tristan took a corner very nicely and slowly because we're being safe. We couldn't have been going more than 10 k's an hour. And then we slowed down even further, approaching a big hump in the road. And then guess who slid off the car? Me. So that happened and I got myself falling off of the car. Then the other thing that happened to me was I made these two lovely cups of coffee for myself and Rebecca and I came walking out of my room with them. Why I went into my room, I don't know. Came down the step and then stood on my ankle funny and well, just face planted basically off my step into the sand, but then threw the two cups of coffee into my face. And, and I just laid there laughing because I thought it was hysterical. I didn't hurt myself because I landed on the beach. And, um, yeah, and then just couldn't see that I was blind because everyone was like, why is she not getting up? And, and then I said, well, I can't see the coffee really stings your eyes, especially when it's boiling hot coffee. And coffee, I don't think, caffeine in your eyes doesn't do very well. So don't do that. <laughs> Jamie, you've said that I'm such a klutz. Yeah, I can't help it though. I don't know why though. So I've had two things happen to me today. I'm waiting for the third thing. I have no idea what it be, be but it might have to do something to do with the fact that I have slip slops on this afternoon to try and get rid of my horrendous sock tan. I won't be doing too much walking, of course. I'll be in the car, so it's not a problem. Be tanning my feet on the safari. So excited about that. And... Uh, I suspect it's, it's something's going to go wrong anyways, because you shouldn't be wearing, well, you not mind the ones I'm wearing on safari. It's a casual Saturday. Anyway, let's go across to the second sassiest person in the team. That's Tristan. Second sassiest, Taylor McCurdy. That is absolute nonsense. I'm definitely not the second sassiest in this entire crew. For sure that you are the queen, but I think Rebecca probably comes in second behind you, I think. Anyway, it's a very warm welcome to a beautiful day in South Africa. And as Taylor mentioned, my name name is Tristan and on camera today I've got David which is always a wonderful thing and so hopefully we're going to have a wonderful afternoon. David and I have said nothing less than 9 out of 10 for our drive today so we're aiming high and hoping that we shall deliver with maybe a spotted cat. So that's where we're going to head off to. We're going to try and see if we can find Hukumuri and so hopefully we'll have you all along for the ride and that you'll ask lots of questions and interact with us using hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or the YouTube chat. Now I must be honest, Taylor's fall today was absolutely glorious for those of you that can just picture of this is that I had a perfect angle for this fall so I was sitting kind of side on as Taylor was emerging from her room I was on the side here and I was on a very serious phone call to Steph and we were just chatting about something that we needed to sort out and all I see is just Taylor emerging from her room and next thing it was a slow motion fall as she just kind of much like a log that had been cut down or a tree that had been cut down she just went straight down boom and coffee into the eyes and then she was sort of crying with laughter because she couldn't open her eyes and couldn't see anything because the hot coffee had gone into her face and which at which point we were all a bit concerned and then she started laughing and then we knew everything was fine but it was absolutely glorious and so as Taylor said the karma in this camp is something that you need to be very careful of and we all need to be able to just be 
be careful about what we say about each other and certainly don't spray things on each other because otherwise you get hot coffee in the eyeballs as a repayment or you fall out of your vehicle. So it's a lesson for both Taylor and I that we are both learning and it seems to be it's when I gave Taylor trouble and when Taylor gives me trouble, karma comes and strikes both of us pretty hard. But anyway, it was highly entertaining and we both had a good laugh about both incidents actually. Now I was saying we're going to go try and find a spotted cat and the, and the reason why we're going to go try and find one is because Hukumuri he was seen by Ali who was at Chitta for a few days and she saw him this morning crossing back onto Juma quite late in the morning so she said to us that he crossed towards sort of treehouse dam area so I'm going to be heading down there in the vehicle and, and I have gotten the help of Rexon and Brent Leo Smith as well and I'm going to deploy them on foot so we're going to use all weapons in order to try and find our crazy eyed newcomer and see if we can kind of get on track with him and maybe try and find him wherever he may be i would imagine it's going to be a very similar situation to yesterday in that he's probably lounging about in the shade for the first hour of drive and then you'll start to get up and move around So giraffe girl, no sightings of Tandy and Talama. It's Saturday. I do apologize. Tandy and Cub, we're going to go for a ride now. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> Nikki's laughing at me in my ear. But, so, we, <laughs> no sightings of them since we had them not yesterday, the day before in the afternoon. And Tandy had a scrub hair kill. I don't know if you saw that, but Tandy had a scrub hair kill and she took it back. To little one and little one played around and had a really good time and it was a very cool sighting that we had so you know <laughs> so they are, are around and then hukamuri arrived that night so i don't know if maybe she's gone back towards tortured we haven't found any tracks but she might be around somewhere in the kind of vicinity and i actually heard a monkey's alarm call close to juma camp this morning just after we closed down so maybe she's hanging around there anyway i said that i've got brent as our secret weapon on foot sounds like he's rearing to go and wants to say good afternoon so let's jump across to him and see whether or not he's onto the tracks of hukamuri yet Well, hello, hello. We don't have tracks yet. We're just doing a cursory skirt of the area to make sure he hasn't wandered out before we hone in on the area to the south of Treehouse Dam. Good afternoon. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Craig on camera and Rex is out with us keeping us safe. So, we're hoping to find Hukumuri, male leopard. Um, he crossed right towards the end of drive into this block behind Craig there and uh, hopefully he'll be around maybe it's been quite hot today so he probably hasn't moved too far now Hukumuri is quite a challenging leopard on foot he's not as relaxed as Hasana and Tandi and uh, so we're gonna have to go very carefully and uh, one must remember that Tingana used to be the same on foot when he first arrived in, in this area and now he's very relaxed on foot so we will keep working on hukumuri sometimes certain leopards just never become relaxed on foot but i'm hoping he will become relaxed on foot now of course i'm going to keep you updated throughout the afternoon about the great quarantine test cricket match that's going to be happening tomorrow uh, in the meantime let's go to well i don't know which team's going to get be unlucky enough to have madame mccurdy because she might just fall over the cricket bat Oh no, Brent, the pressure that you've just put on my shoulders now. I think I might be sick and absent for that match tomorrow, perhaps. But we're with the Nkuhumas now. Courtesy of Tristan pointing us in the right direction. Now, I do, let me just jump on this game, everybody, because I better call myself in very, very swiftly if we watch these two lioness pant. She's going to drink. Okay, we'll go there. Uh, stations relocated on the Nguhuma Pride. Uh, they're still all around Chele Pan. One o'clock. I'll be going radio down, but you're welcome to come join. Radio off. There's another lioness. What's happened to your eye? Is this the one with the sore eye? And uh, I don't have. Yes. Are you a youngster, though. What's happened to you? Hey. What's, oh, I don't even have my binoculars. I'm just trying to quickly stare and see what's happened to this this youngster. 
I don't know when that injury occurred. I haven't really seen the Nkuhumas. I mean, I've sat with them. We had them one afternoon. Ah, apparently both of these two have injured eyes. I wasn't here when the Nkuhuma, one of the lionesses, got an injured eye, and I don't know if she can see from it anymore. And this one, it's not great. Sit still, will you please? The first time you hear me asking a lion to sit still. Okay, no, well, I'm probably not going to get a decent view. Uh, that doesn't look nice, eh? Hey? I wonder what's happened to her. If it got scratched, injured, and taking down some prey, maybe just running through a thicket and not being careful and got poked in the eye by a stick, or just a simple infection. I don't see any obvious cuts around the eye. Well, we'll try and figure out what happened to that one. Oh, they're all coming out. All of them. Now, one has gone to drink, but I think we might be a bit late to catch it drinking. So let's hope this other lioness sort of uh, heads on over. And they've been very kind this afternoon, just uh, very quietly coming out one at a time. Just one at a time, which is very nice. They've been sleeping away in a Tambwiti thicket for most of the day, keeping out of the sun. I don't blame them. Now, something that we don't know, unfortunately, is what these lions ate this morning. And uh, so there we go, Francis from Israel. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, we haven't got a clue. Tristan was the one who found them, and he said when he got here, they had swollen bellies and they were still covered in blood. So I haven't got a clue what they ate, neither does Tristan. Um, this lioness, is, they've, they've all got you know, biggish bellies. She doesn't have as big as the others. But there are a lot of lions in here. So, you know, it is... Um, here we go. There's two more. Is that old amber eyes coming out there? Yes. Hello, girl. It um, It's difficult to say. I mean, even a buffalo, a small buffalo, would have done them good. What are they looking at? I think they're looking at that maybe the other lion that's already gone to drink one of the youngsters. One, two, three. All big girls are here. Oh, uh, there is that the one with the injured eye? Oh, no, maybe it was just seeing things. Hard to tell. Come on, come on around. It would be nice to actually get a chance to have a look at these lionesses in the, the day when they're not squabbling over a carcass. Now, Joanna, I'm not sure if those were injuries from the avocas. Like I said, I haven't seen the Nkuhum pride for a very long time. I think we're going to reverse, though, VM, once this lioness goes. She's now just also decided she wants to go with the rest. We'll go watch him drink water. I suspect that's where they're going. I, I don't know what's happened to the sub-adults either. Uh, the last time I saw them, they were sort of face deep in a... Oh, no. We're trapped. Well, basically, so I'm just trying to make sure we don't drive over any thickets. I'm going to have to wait for her. She's using luxury facilities at the moment. This might take a while. Do you want a newspaper, girl? Um... Sorry, that's also the antenna in the way there. Um, basically, I haven't seen them. And the last time I did see them properly was, uh, like I said, they were eating a buffalo carcass. It was very hard to tell what had gone on. Shame, little one. That doesn't look too nice. So I'm going to have a proper look around and, and get all these cats having a drink of water. So I'm going to reposition very quickly. And while we do that, I'm going to send you uh, to Tristan. So, well... See if he's any closer to finding Hukumuri. Well, we right where Taylor had Hukumuri this morning on foot. And so I'm just double checking these little mud wallows and the areas around these mud wallows just in case he's not lying in the shade somewhere because sometimes you'll find a situation where these leopards get into a, a place where there's a bit of water and then they just lie down roughly in those areas and sort of spend a bit of time in the shade. We saw yesterday uh, with Brent, he walked towards the sort of pans of Ingwe Alley and then he just lay down in the shade for the hot part of the day. So it's always good just to go slowly in these areas, double check under the shady sections, make sure that he's not having a bit of a rest somewhere here. So bad Andy, in all likelihood, yes, the answer to that is that Tingana has been driven out well I don't know if driven out is the right word but, but he's no longer patrolling here so we haven't seen Tingana patrol this area for two sort of two months now and that means that probably he's not going to come back good now we're going to quickly jump across back to Taylor because I believe the lions are starting to have a drink oh there they are they're having a drink they're having a drink that's for certain 
Ha! Ah, lions, what on earth have you lot been up to that you've all got these injuries? I actually can't even remember when the old uh, Nkuhuma lioness got that injury in her eye. I was in, I think I may have been in the Mara when it happened. I can't ever recall seeing her uh, with that injury. Now, the other lion, the little lion, who's not so little anymore, but the sub-adult, like I said, there's no obvious scratches at all. So I don't know if a stick maybe poked it in the eye. Like I said, it could just be an infection. It's very difficult to tell, I'm afraid. But maybe it will be okay. It looked a bit sort of mucky and, you know, there was a, a little bit of fluid around the eye. It seemed to be quite sensitive to the sun. But again, these animals are so tough and resilient. We just have to look at that in Kuma Lioness that had the massive gaping gash on her hip and how she recovered. That was pretty impressive. I'm sure you'll all agree with me because everyone was very worried about her and thought that she may pass on. That was a serious injury and she's definitely vulnerable to infection. But she's pulled through. So let's just hope. Um, oh, it doesn't matter. You know what? If that lion unfortunately loses sight in its one eye, there's, she's still going to be able to carry on. They live in a pride. She's not living on her own, so they've got one another to rely on too. Now, just going back to what we were just speaking about, Magic Magan Dragon. Um, oh, no, VM. Can you hear that? Oh, no. Hang on. Oh, no, everybody. I'm getting a flat tire. It sounds like it's coming from the valve. Okay, well, I'm going to obviously have to leave the lions to change the tire. That's fun. Lions, please don't go anywhere. Like, don't go far. I'm so sorry for the inconvenience, everybody. We have a flat tire. Yay, it's going sss. So while we go and find a safe spot to change the tire and hope that the Nkumas don't run away, I'm going to send you back to Tristan. Well, I'm sorry, Taylor. I feel guilty now because I was the last one in that car and I hope it wasn't me that caused you to have a flat tire and it's the worst thing when you get a flat tire. So I can sympathize with Taylor quite quickly on that regard. But hopefully she'll get it sorted out fairly quickly and then be back with the Nkuma Pride. And I'm very surprised actually that the Nkuma Pride are up and walking. Now we've come towards Treehouse Dam and we don't have any sign of Hukumuri yet. It's not to say that he isn't around here. We do have other spots though. However, straight ahead of me is some other spots that are kind of not hidden, but behind the termite mound. So there is a giraffe that we've got behind the termite mound and is taking it very easy. Seems as though it's having a little feed off one of the trees behind there. I can't see which type of tree because of the distance that we are from this particular fella. But you can see he is a male. He's got those balding big thick ossicones on the back and he's also got a very dark coloration and very tall as well so it's a situation where he's quite big and that's normally an indication of male if you see those telltale signs now of course dark coloration is not always male you do get females that are dark in coloration it's it's not it's a bit of a myth that only males are dark it's just more males are dark than females in the giraffe world but it's nice to see these guys i haven't really been seeing too many giraffe over the course of the last few weeks in fact i think this is the first giraffe i've seen since i've been back from leave so always pleasant when we get our tall lanky elegant creatures that walk around here they are a pretty amazing animal to be able to survive the way that they do and, and kind of the structure that their body is is pretty amazing so a really cool animal to have around and it's interesting how the giraffe in this area sort of seem I, don't know, I wouldn't call them migratory, but they seem to follow patterns as food comes out. So we see a lot of them around the time when the acacias are flowering, particularly knob thorns. So in the July, August time frames, that's when we'll see a lot of giraffe kind of coming into this area, going to feed off those creamy white flowers that are full of pollen. And then you'll find them when the acacias are also flowering as well. But I'm going to try and get a little closer because we are quite far away. I just wanted to get an initial view in case our giraffe disappeared into the thickets. But let's carry on a little bit closer towards it. Now, no leopard anywhere here. No, it doesn't look like it. 
seems all quiet on the treehouse front. Um, so not much there, but Rexon is calling me, which is obviously Brent as well. Go ahead, Rex. So we're just going to find out an update from them. Okay. Copy that. Thanks, Rex. I'll head in that direction. So we're going to leave our giraffe very quickly because Rexon says that he's got Kudu alarm calling somewhere around Twin Dams, Mulawati area. Now that's not too far away, so we're going to do a little Ferrari safari to try and get there as quick as possible. Hold on, David. Excellent. So David says he's holding, which means that allows us to make our way. So we're going to try and get sort of towards Twin Dams as quick as we can. Maybe little Hosanna is lurking or somebody's around. While we do that, let's send you across to the man that heard the alarm calls in the form of Brent. Well, Rexon actually heard them first, when we're a bit too far to try dash down there in this heat. We can hear, I can hear Tristan. Boop, 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 boop. Better not break my car. Uh, but yeah, so they sort of due, due to the uh, east of us. We're going to keep looking for Kumari though. We're pretty confident he's around here somewhere. Now, the thing about tracking in this type of area, if we look at the ground, you can see how hard it is. And even if I put my foot there, almost barely a track to follow. So what we do in situations like this is you, you try to think like an animal. So if I was a Hukumuri, where would I walk? Why would I walk there? So I don't want too much grass on my face, so I'm going to take these areas that have a little bit less tall grass. Now, look at this. This whole area of grass is completely flat underneath this tree. Now, I wonder if you guys can tell me what did that? Hashtag Safari Live. What and why is the grass flat under this particular tree? Okay, let's keep going carefully. There's a couple of nice big termite mounds up here. No, Nicola in final control is guessing. She's got the species right, but not the reason. Last time I ran up a termite mound, Tandy was on the other side, so I'm going to go a bit slower up this one. And when we head up, it's always good to just take a moment and listen. That's how we heard those kudu alarm calls. Let's take a seat here. Uh, and there's some very important species out here, and we call them keystone species. Mr. Callan. Uh, there are various different keystone species. It also depends on the ecosystem. Uh, here, elephants, buffalo, rhino, lion, leopard uh, are all keystone species. So your bulk grazers. So if you had to remove any one of those species, hyenas and other keystone species, it would fundamentally change the balance of the environment. So hippos in this part of the Sabi Sands, not really a keystone species. Sand River area keystone species because they keep the channels open and keeps the river flowing for longer. Okavango Delta, Hippozo, keystone species. Up here, the big herds of buffalo, elephants, uh, the lions, their interaction. So if you had to remove any of those specific species, it would completely change the dynamic of, of what happens here. Now, on a lot of the private game reserves, a lot of those keystone species have been removed. The smaller private game reserves, like where my parents live, and at the moment busy trying to reintroduce them. So one of the, the big effects, and elephants probably the most important of those keystone species in a lot of ways, because if you remove elephants, 
your bush becomes very, very thick. So if there were no elephants here, this would be almost an impenetrable wall that we wouldn't be able to walk through very easily at all. And you can see, just by glancing over there, lots of broken branches uh, and, and, and sticks, and it, everything's just been pushed and, and managed and maintained by the elephants. So one of the biggest problems facing people who are reintroducing animals into an area is that if you remove one of those keystone species, like elephants in particular in this case, uh, your biodiversity falls. Because those elephants keep the areas open, there's more chance for grass, so you have higher numbers of wildebeest, higher numbers of impala, higher numbers of your other browsers. So that's an example of a very important keystone species. Uh, there are lots of different things. Frogs are keystone species. And you remove frogs, insects can get out of control. Termites, like the termite mound we're sitting on, are very important keystone species. Uh, they are one of the most important in providing huge amounts of nutrients and, uh, into, the, into the ground as well as food for a whole plethora of different animals who would have to completely change their habits if termites disappeared. Bees is another good example of a keystone species. So it doesn't have to be something big and, and prominent like an elephant or a lion. It can be something as tiny as a millimeter. Ah, it sounds like we have some answers for our little quiz from earlier. You guys are too smart for me today. Uh, P. Hart, Kathy, and many, many others, you are spot on. We were under a murula tree that was fruiting a month or so ago, and that flattened grass is from when the elephants were there after the marulas. Now, I haven't heard any more alarm calls. We're just listening to see if we could help Tristan. I think it could be Hosanna coming back from Little Gauri. Okay, let's keep moving. Let's see if Hokomori's maybe headed straight towards Treehouse Dam for a drink in this hot weather. Now, while we do that, let's send you to Tristan, who's got to the area of those alarm calls. Well, we're not at Treehouse Brent, we're at Twin Dams, and we are around the sort of dam, and we went into Mulawati, and we're trying to see if we can find any sign of anything. No sign of kudu at the moment, alarm calling or even the kudus themselves. Found a lot of impalas around Twin Dams itself. So I don't think anything's going on there. They were all very relaxed. They were just sitting having a little, what is it, like they were having a tea party or a Sunday afternoon get together. And so what I'm trying to do now is just quickly check on the eastern side, just to double check on Ledwood Road, make sure there's no sign here. And then I'm gonna bounce to the elephant sort of carcass just in case there's a leopard sort of hanging around near the elephant carcass but I'm trying to find the kudus is what I'm actually trying to find because if I find the kudu then I'll know exactly where we need to look at the moment though no kudus that I can see the only kudu I saw was a treehouse dam so Donna there is still a little bit left of the dead elephant there's three feet and a trunk and a bit of the head and then probably a little bit of meat in underneath the rib cage and, and that area but not much so there's not really too much left but it's still enough to sustain vultures and hyenas probably for another day i would imagine is how long they would stick around still and so we'll just have to see now there's an impala that looks very relaxed two impalas that look really relaxed come on kudus are we looking for kudus we that's what we're trying to search for I'm pretty sure if we find the kudus, we'll have a rough idea of where we need to check. I don't see any tracks though for any kind of movement of a leopard or any lions or anything like that. Hmm. Could it have been a false alarm? I don't think so. Rex would have known if it was repeated calling, if, especially if it's you hear it a lot then you know, if kudus bark often, then they definitely have seen something. So it's just a matter of finding exactly where these kudu are, and that will lead us to where we need to be, and hopefully to the quarry that we are looking for this afternoon. No, no tracks there. So, child of the universe, difficult to say. Um, I wouldn't push as far as to say he's not, or Tingana is not 
um, territorial anymore. I, I would just say that he's in a situation where his territory has shrunk massively and he still marks and he's still uh, he's scraping his back feet and urinating and I, as far as I understand it's still vocalizing around the sort of Chitwa area but he's not nearly kind of as active about patrolling and scent marking as he was this time last year so it's a bit of a different situation that we've got and you know we'll just see how it goes it's going to be interesting to kind of work out how this is going to play out and whether or not he is actually just kind of given up on being a territorial male and is just going to be like in Vula and take it easy for a few months and years and then just be a bit more nomadic than what those two boys are so we'll just have to see it's going to be like I say an interesting time Now I believe Taylor has sorted out her flat tire, so let's send you back across to her so she can tell you the tale of how she fixed her tire near the lions. Well, I think that's the third thing now that's gone wrong to me today is a flat tire. Also don't change flat tires in slip slops, it's not clever. You could lose a toe quite easily, but we managed, we survived. We're just very dirty now, and guess it wasn't even a thorn, it was just a valve that went. Oh well. We've changed it. Lions have had a drink. We're about to have a drink and quench our thirst. We're pretty filthy though now, as you normally are after a tire changing event. Hello, huh, Lions. Did you enjoy watching us? We didn't actually park very far away from these cats. Maybe like 150 meters from where they are. One little, I keep saying little because in my heart, the Nguma cubs are still cubs and not sub adults anymore. But one of the youngsters just stood and watched from a distance like, what are you people doing? Why are you out of the car? We hid behind some bushes, but she sort of took a few steps to make herself known. But they were all very relaxed, as you can see. I'm just going to have a sip of water. Ha! Whew. That's delicious. Now, our dear friend Michael Fleetwood has been very kind and started putting together some great ID cards for the Nkuhumas. So thank you again for that, Michael. Um, and Kim, one of those ID cards of, of co uh, is, of course, of Floppy Ear. My favorite little lion cub who does not have a floppy ear anymore. And I haven't seen all of the lions now. I mean, I was hoping to see them when they were drinking water and have a proper look at them. But now I don't know how to tell her apart. She, I remember she always used to have relatively sort of amber eyes. I'm wiping everything because I promise you I'm absolutely fil filthy. I'm not quite a germaphobe. I just don't like dirt. So, if any of you know which one our darling, dearest, the floppy-eared lion who is no longer floppy-eared is, you can let us know. I'm waiting for her personality to stand out. We've got one youngster here, and then the young male. And I don't know, maybe that's her. Not the, not the two we're looking at, these are adults. These are, of course, adults walking around. They don't seem to be too bothered by the heat, as you can see, up and down, which is quite nice for us. Just enjoying the shade, panting heavily. Obviously, they've had a decent breakfast. I reckon they'll go out hunting tonight, though. Or maybe tomorrow morning, looking for their next meal. Maybe this afternoon, if we're really, really, really lucky, of course. But we'll um, have to wait and see. Now, oh, fam, goodness gracious, <laughs> that's the quickest pan I've ever seen in the whole world. Well done. Fam could do the Olympics for this. So, Costa, yes, you're quite correct in saying that lions and leopards typically keep away from one another, specifically the leopards trying to keep away from the lions, because as m myself, Tristan and Brent have witnessed many, many times, and, and some of you even while watching Safari Light, lions love to steal kills whenever there's an opportunity, whether it's from wild dogs, whether it's from a cheetah, a clan of hyenas, or even a leopard with its kill up in the tree. They'll quite happily chase those spotted cats away, and um and, and will claim their their kill for their own and eat it so so yes they try and avoid it one another Ooh, this sounds very exciting and very promising it seems as though brent has not quite found hukumuri just yet there's kudus alarming and now it seems as though he's got some tracks 
So as I was saying, we need to think like a leopard. We haven't seen a track for 300 meters through the thick grass. And that's all you need. You need just one little sign. And you can see how difficult on this hard ground it is to see the track. And there we go. That's the back. There's one that little stick here. So he has the back pad there. And then the toes up there. And he stood on a piece of a dung beetle by the looks of things. Yes piece of a beetle that he stood on. Now while we were looking at this track I noticed something we don't see very often at all and that is Stiernbok dung because they bury it but another animal has come through here and kicked it up a little bit so if I dig a little bit this is a baby Stiernbok, a very small Stiernbok, not an adult but there's Stiernbok dung buried here so look at that so we, we hardly ever see Stiernbok dung because it is buried and there we go so it's not an adult, so it looks like a youngster from the size. Okay, well, he's making a beeline for Treehouse Dam. So uh, we didn't have any tracks of him coming out there. So we're going to keep going. He might still between be, be between us and the dam. So as I said, you've just got to think like a leopard. And leopards don't like grass seeds in their eyes and things like that. And uh, so you try sort of imagine being at a leopard's height and then moving through the area that has the least grass that will give him the best possible visibility. Now we're going to keep there's this track again there, tracking Hook Omuri, but let's go back to Taylor and the lights. Yep, we haven't gone anywhere and I think I found our little floppy-eared girl. Is this her? Did you once used to have an ear that flopped? Yes? The reason why I think it's her because she didn't quite have the same colored eyes as Amber Eyes did, one of our favorite lionesses, but um, she didn't have yellow eyes. And she looks like the youngest one in the pride, and she should be the youngest one in the pride. So this looks like her to me. Perhaps you can confirm. You can hashtag Safari Live. Let me know, yay or nay. But I, I, I think it is her for now and there's another little one just sitting to the right that's actually also got the most gorgeous eyes and keeps looking up into the air perhaps they've seen some of those vultures that were flying around will probably are flying around near the elephant carcass but they are so so beautiful man i love this pride of lions now something quite interesting is we didn't see any lions at that carcass. I haven't been watching the camera right through the evening though, so maybe some of you saw differently. So Claudia, no, no lions that I saw of went to the carcass at all. However, I did have the entire Nkuhuma Pride's tracks going past it. Not not right next to the carcass, but just on one of the roads. But they looked like they stopped and they sniffed and then they carried on going again. I'm so sorry, I dr uh, drank my water so quickly. I've got hiccups now. And what is on that one side? Can you see that, Vian? on this one here. What's hanging from the side there? It's a stick. Oh, looks like it's maybe just attached to the hair. Maybe it's not a thorn going inside. Oh, is it? Oh, and now? What is that all about? Looks like it got a bit of a, a sore hip all of a sudden, or maybe just stood funny, but it's back again. Now, the reason why, Claudia, I don't think that those lions um, went to that kill is because of basically everything that's changing at the moment the evoker males being around and uh, stirring a bit of nonsense here potentially being the ones that killed the youngest cub of the Nkuhuma pride which is very uh, very sad the fact that it's still not here means that it, it's it's i think it's gone just with everything that happened i mean those boys came charging on in so i think they thought if they went and ate there it's gonna that's basically a hot spot with all the vultures around with the hyenas uh, you know the whooping the the scents that'll be down on the ground the scent from the carcass i think they thought that they'd be very vulnerable heading down there and i think they just want to lay low at the moment i'm almost certain that this is our floppy eared girl there's just something about her that's sort of shout sassiness, but we'll see when she gets up and walks. Okay, we'll have to see when you eat on a carcass, if you're still as frisky as you were before. Now, VM and I are quite excited this afternoon because it is only 10 past 4 Central African time, and these cats are up and down already. So here we go, putting myths sort of to rest. 
big cats do move around during the heat of the day. Now, as far as I'm concerned, or I'm not concerned, I understand, Dale, we've only lost one cub now this year, which is very sad, of course. Um, so there should be five adult lionesses and six sub-adults, one being a male. Unfortunately, uh, we did lose two of these the uh, that would have been sub-adults now last year to white muscle disease. It was quite sad, I think. One was a male, one was a female. But there initially were eight Nkuhuma cubs. But sadly, no more. There you go. Another one just walking behind the car. So there should be 11 of them. What happened to the tuft on her tail? Does it look short to you, Vian? A little bit. Looks like it's missing a little bit of the tuft of the black there. Perhaps she just never had much of it at all. Maybe she hasn't brushed it yet today. But all of them kindly blocking VM and I in as well. Land mines everywhere. We don't really know where to go. I shall move for you. We shall follow the cats. And now I'm scared. There was an enormous, enormous bit of dung that one lion, lioness produced. Sure. I was quite surprised, in fact. It looked like about four lions had defecated in one spot. Yes, right, let's go around. Fantastic. Kitty cats, you're moving out into the open. Um, Paula, it should be... Oh, that's a foul smell. Um, it should be a couple of weeks before that lioness that lost the cub comes back into Eastress again. And um, hopefully the Birmingham boys will be around because that, that might, of course, cause a stir. I'm just going to park us here. You can see that lion when, sorry, VM is of course just living in the camera because I parked like an idiot up on the slope. But the lioness with the injury, I'm so impressed with her. She really, really is coming along nicely. It does look like she's opened that wound just a little bit, but that's probably from licking. And remember, if they are charging after a buffalo or prey of sorts through these uh, sort of thickets, it's quite easy that she's going to open it again. A branch might hook on it. Um, if she's scrapping with the other lions, it could reopen the wound. But it does look like every day it's getting better, and she's also most certainly putting on weight again. And that's the most important thing, is that she's gaining weight, she's gaining muscle, they're eating regularly, and she's keeping that wound nice and clean, which is great, great, great news. And it's obviously just a bit difficult for that one that's got the eye injury, because she's unable to lick it clean. She'll just have to, well, let it heal on its own. And hopefully, hopefully her eye, her eye will be okay. But I, yes, it will definitely sort of stop her from being as good of a hunter as what she may have been with both eyes. But it's just one of those things she'll learn to live with her disability and carry on. Right, Tristan is not too far away. He's made his way down towards the elephant carcass. Let's go see if there's any scavengers hanging about. Well, we made our way here just in case those kudu were alarm calling it, maybe a leopard that was coming just to investigate what was going on. But alas, there is no sign of any leopard anywhere near here that I can see. I'm just turned off for a while and sitting. Even though there's no action or no animals really feeding off it, there was one or two vultures, but they flew off as we arrived. And you can see there's not that much left. There's a few kind of bits of feet that are sticking around. And you can actually see pretty amazing in the middle of that carcass, is a kind of the pad of the one foot so there you can see how the pad has almost been kind of peeled away now i know it's pretty graphic so if you don't like graphic things then it's not probably not for you but not that one there dave if you can go to the left for me and towards the rib cage and then straight there down a little bit and that there so there you can see the toenails of the foot and that's the actual pad there's the hardened leathery type pad that has been kind of peeled off from the actual fatty part of the foot so that they can get into that because that is going to be incredibly difficult to eat that's almost like a rock as opposed to the fatty pad underneath and so what they've done is they've peeled away the toenails and the foot and to get in to the actual good parts of the feet itself which is pretty crazy and if you look to the left i might need to go forward Dave. let me go forward a little bit because it's actually quite amazing if you have a look there so now that i've gone forward a bit in there you can see what i was talking about they've eaten that fatty pad away completely so that's where that pad is that basically cushions the elephant's foot and allows it 
to be able to walk and so they've gotten in there and that's probably pretty tasty and so they've eaten all of that cushioning away and that's why they would have peeled off those toenails and that bottom part of the foot to be able to expose that and so really not too much left here there's just a little bit like I say in the form of the legs and then around the head and obviously the trunk has done the distance too which is very surprising normally the trunk is something that gets eaten fairly quickly and, and kind of gets absorbed but it's amazing the kind of damage that was done to this poor elephant's body when he fell. The fact that there's, there's ribs that are broken, there's hip joints that are broken, the jaw is broken, all from the force of him falling on his side when he died, which is absolutely amazing to me. The kind of damage that this poor thing endured when it went in. Now, it would have been amazing to actually have seen it had scavengers not been here and, and hyenas and vultures fighting and squabbling, uh, squabbling and breaking and pulling to actually have seen if there's any sign of damage from the tusk of the other animal if it did any sign any damage to the actual rib cage itself i would have been interested just to see how deep that sort of puncture wound went and if it actually nicked any of the bones within the inside it would have been quite fascinating to have gone through that but there's so far no sign of anything else here i'm going to actually just try and sit here for a little bit just keep listening because maybe we get another alarm call and while we do that let's send you back across to brent who's hopefully still on the trail of those tracks and heading in our direction tristan's just waiting to try one up me with an egyptian vulture i'm sure uh, we've made it to treehouse dam and you can see the blue green algae and it doesn't look like he's been here to drink yet because a leopard will normally drink at the top corner like this looks like oh, there's a hyena that came down that's all but they'll, they'll normally drink at the top corner and the reason for this is that they're scared of crocodiles and in little narrow inlets like this uh, it's likely to be at its most shallow I just want to check a little bit further and you could have drunk anywhere around this area But, doesn't look like he has. Hi, Willow. Yes, Willow. The Easter Bunny does come here. Our Easter Bunny even has a name. Our Easter Bunny's name is Geraldine. She, she comes with lots of eggs. Uh, so we will, yes, definitely have Easter eggs tomorrow, for breakfast even. Willow, I hope you get lots of Easter eggs as well. Okay, no sign of the leopard here. So what we're going to do is we're going to head up here a little bit. There are the pans at the top of Shabam, so you might have changed direction in the block. Uh, we might have disturbed him. We heard some birds alarm calling. So we're going to keep moving, and hopefully we catch up with Hukumuri. And in the meantime, we'll go to someone, Willow, who loves Easter eggs the most, Taylor McCurdy. You say this, but I don't think I'm the one that enjoys Easter eggs the most in camp. But Louise is pretty good at eating Easter eggs. BM, who else is the Easter egg sneaker? Darby. Darby is terrible. Um, Nikki, you didn't eat the Easter eggs, did you? I don't know, there's quite a few Easter egg lovers in camp. Uh, I'm very fussy. I'm like Nikki. Nikki and I don't like the marshmallows inside the Easter eggs. You can give us the Ferrero Rochers, the lint ones. Mmm. Now I want those chocolates. Anyways, so yes, we don't do marshmallows, but uh, all the other chocolate we, of course, will eat. And I hope that that Easter bunny is ready to leave the moon. It's a long way to Earth. Because, you know, I know that the Easter Bunny lives in the mood. Willow, if you're still watching, we'll see if we can try and show you the Easter Bunny in the moon tonight. It's very cool. And um, you better come back down here. Sometimes they say when you get older, the Easter Bunny doesn't come and visit you as much. But, um, you know, he came last year, and I'm hoping that at 25, he's still going to come and visit us. Viam, you want the Easter Lion to come and visit you. I heard you whispering. Mm. Easter lion would be quite terrifying. Imagine him knocking on your door. Hello, hello, Viam. Don't mean to disturb, but here's your Easter eggs. <laughs> That'd be terrifying. Yes. So, um, say again. As long as it's a, he wants a white lion Easter bunny. Fair enough. That is true. 
There we go. You've heard it here from the one and only VM. He'll be here all night. <laughs> Anyways, now we've got a carpet of lions, which is my fillet, uh, my favorite. Oh, goodness, this is going to be a long day. Which is my favorite collective noun for a group of lions. And like I said, there's no real wrong collective noun for a group of cats or any animal, in fact. So get creative. Let's see if anybody's got any anything different. I like a carpet of lions. That's my favorite. Viam, what's your favorite collective noun to use to describe a group of cats? <laughs> we'll ask Viam just now. Ooh. Now, Chat Noir... I don't know what the lions would do if they have a rent in, in sort of in the litter. I suppose it's it's really just going to fight um, for its right in the pride. I don't think the lionesses would ever. I suppose if they didn't want it, some lionesses end up abandoning their cubs. That definitely happens. Um, but it's, but I mean I've actually never witnessed. I've never witnessed lions going, "We don't want this cub anymore," type thing. Um, so if there's a, a little one. Well, they're going to have to just try their absolute best uh, to keep up with the rest of them and make sure that it can fight for an opportunity to suckle. That's going to be its biggest thing. It's just not getting enough milk. So if it can make it past that and all the bullying that it will receive from everyone else, then it'll grow up to be fine. It'll just um, it'll just have very s strong character, I suppose. No, oh, kitty cats, I can see you want to get up. Now, if we try and find some lion that's sitting not in the grass, which seems to be impossible now. Um, Chat Noir. Was it Chat Noir, or did I already answer that question? Gordo. I already did that one. Sorry, Gordo. Uh, so, Gordo, what we're trying to show you is... There we go. Now this youngster is going to stand up. We can quickly have a look at uh, the sort of spots that the lion has. So they, they're not quite rosettes. They're more sort of spots, and it's very typical for young lions to have it. When they're small, they're completely covered in them, and it's to help with camouflage. However, as they get older, some of them don't lose their spots at all. Those spots don't necessarily fade. Um, other lionesses lose them completely, or it's the same thing with male lions too. And uh, so it's really just there for camouflage when they're when they are younger. Uh, that's all. I, I do want to just tell everybody that I am still in luck with these lions. Let's see how much chatter there is. Otherwise, they don't get any update. Guess who's chatting on the radio? Chitter chatterer Tristan. Maybe while he's on the radio, he can update my lion sighting for me and say that there's still a chili pan and that I'm still here. Because I am I can just see the radios going and going and going, and I don't like a game dot radio. It's the worst thing in the whole world. What are you cats doing? You're in the sun, then you want to go to the shade? And then you're in the sun. Now they're all moving back to the shade again. This is so funny. It's like they're fidgety. I mean, I don't think they look too uncomfortable. Sometimes the lion's bellies are touching the ground which um, I, I can imagine can't be very nice. I mean, I bet all of you have at some point in your life overindulged to the point that you've uh, got severe stomach cramps. These cats don't look like they would have stomach cramps at the moment. Um, normally after they've feasted on a buffalo for two days, uh, you might be able to see that. And also you, you sort of can see they, they, the lines, and this is a bit gross, but it's just one of those things. I don't think it's gross because it's normal. Um, they, their stool was quite hard, in fact. And sometimes when they've got those big bursting bellies, they tend to have a very sort of upset stomach and can tend to have diarrhea. But n not from what I could see. So that's why I, thought. I don't think they, they did overindulge in anything. I think they just had the right amount. Very cool, though. To see these cats. Oh, there we go. What do we have answers for? What was the question? Oh, yes, the collective noun. I was like, what? Did, what happened? <laughs> ah, Louise, for your collective noun and lions, you've said a cuddle of lions. That's very cute. A cuddle. Very nice. Good luck going to cuddle these lions. I don't know if they'd want you to cuddle with them. I'm just watching what's happening. I'm really hoping that a herd of Inyala come walking on through here. That would be ideal. Now, they haven't shown too many signs of waking up. They're standing up, sitting down, but but nothing too much. And Monty, spread of lions is the one that you've gone with. That's a goodie too. A spread of lions, I like that. See, you can just get so creative. 
Ooh, Cassandra, a laze of lines. Good, that's another goodie. That is very nice. I mean, you can you can go all out here. Ooh, there we go. UK expat, I'm with Nikki on this one. I don't know what it means, but it sounds great. A lolly gag of lions. Perhaps you can elaborate a little bit more to help our simple South African minds understand what lolly gag means. I'm just joking. When I say simple South African minds, please don't get offended. I don't mean that in any offensive way whatsoever. I'm just trying to be a little bit funny. It maybe wasn't so funny, so I take it back. Let's just forget. This is the part where I pick up one of those um, things on from Men in Black that erase your memory. I've got one of those. Where are you going, girl? Okay, so one lioness has decided, right, she's done with laying about. She's going to go on the move now. A couple of the youngsters are staring at her, and I'm hoping they're going to follow her. Could be going to another set of pans. So this is quite exciting. So what we'll do is we'll jump up ahead of her, because I think the rest of them will just follow. And let's go see if Brent has still got his nose to the floor. Well... I definitely have my eyes to the floor. Here we go. Okamori. Oh, Tracks sort of in, heading in the direction we predicted. Now, he is a leopard that loves a good zigzag. So, what we're going to do is we're going to try second guess him now. So, we're going to go around this thick area here and down Savage's track. Because just in case he does one of his silly tricks, which is go down and then turn around and come back up towards Shabam Road. So we're going to just double check that. And then if nothing, and there's no tracks coming out on the other side, we know he's sleeping in this little river system here. So he's keeping us busy. Rex has got more tracks here. He's running. What you got, Drex? On top. Your tracks are on top. So this is him from this morning. There we go. Is that whose track is that? Yours, Rex? Or Taylor's track? Taylor's got that bigger feet. No, can't be. Taylor's got such big feet. Who would have thought? Yeah. So these are the tracks from when um, you had him this morning. It looks like. So. Uh, I can't believe Taylor's got such big feet. Maybe that's why she keeps falling over all the time. They just get stuck on everything. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see her on the cricket field tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm still trying to get over the size of Taylor's feet. Um, <laughs> And it seems like she stood on every leopard track as well. Um, but so that means he's still in here. We'll hopefully get a separate set of tracks towards the water here. Uh, now, yesterday we had a very in interesting interaction between Hokumuri and Hosanna. Uh, Megan, you might not have been watching, but uh, Hosanna heard Impala alarm calling. We were with Hokumuri and he came to inspect to see if maybe it was Tandi um, uh, or Tingana or even Tamba. Uh, watch out, Craig. And uh, as immediately as he saw it was Hokumuri, he sort of started slinking off, but he was very silly. He stopped on top of a termite mound and was watching Hokumuri. Then Hokumuri spotted him and started stalking him, and he ran away. If Hokumuri catches Hasana, he will most likely try to kill him. Uh, he's got no relation uh, to, to, to Hokumuri. There's no reason for Hokumuri to keep and let Hosanna be in this area. He is, he is another male leopard. In Hokumuri's mind, he is a threat. Uh, he needs to be chased away uh, as soon as possible or killed if possible. So that's what he would do, Megan. Now, I said I would tell you a little bit about tomorrow's cricket game. So we're going to split into two teams. And uh, the captains are going to be Tristan and myself, but we haven't chosen our teams yet. I think that'll have to happen tomorrow morning. But uh, we had a little practice session this afternoon. And uh, I don't know, I was feeling quite comfortable with the willow in my hands. And um, of course, 
Who knows? Maybe Taylor McCurdy's the dark horse. I mean, she does come from serious cricketing stock. Her dad was a fast bowler for Australia. Uh, so we'll have to see. There could be some surprise cricketers amongst our, our, our crew who we've uh, written off that might have the X factor. <laughs> now, uh, sorry, Nixon, catch the name. Who was asking about my walking stick? Paula! Um, my stick doesn't actually, well, I suppose it's developed a story. It didn't have a story. So um, I found it on Bushwalk the one morning uh, on Zoe's Road. It's a large fluted bush willow, Combritum zaheri, that has been broken off by elephants. Now, since I got a stick on Bushwalk, I thought it, I thought it was prudent that uh, James Henry should also have a stick. So I got him a little mini stick that he could carry because he can't carry a big stick. It's too heavy for him and he's too small. So it became a, a bit of a standing, an ongoing joke between James and I about our sticks. So I gave, and he lost the stick I gave him. How rude is that? Uh, so you have to find a replacement one. But since then, I suppose I've carried this stick on almost every single bushwalk I've done. Um, it's been on TV uh, in America. And, uh, yeah, even when I went to Kenya, I didn't take it with me. I left it in the tech room. So when I got back, I would still have my stick. It is also very useful for bopping, cam bopping cameramen who misbehave on the head. Um, also, well, I used it today to poke Taylor when she was being cheeky and keep her at distance. She's quite feisty. So it's good for keeping Taylor and her big feet at bay. Uh, but, uh, oh, it's, I don't know, it's just got a nice weight to it. But let's go see what Tristan's up to. Well, we're doing a spot of birding, Brenty, as we're watching four red-billed hornbills bouncing around and just kind of having a little look and checking to see what's happening around them. They're not really too active, actually. They're just sitting in amongst the foliage and keeping a beady eye on what's going on which is pretty typical for hornbills they normally like this and it must be a family of two adults and maybe two chicks that are almost fully fledged now they've got their adult colored plumage and so I'd imagine that they're probably going to go off on their own fairly shortly but we've left twin dams area because there was no signs that we could find of any leopard walking around there no tracks no more alarm calls and what i think might be the case is maybe just maybe i spoke to brent and rex about it is that that alarm call might have been coming from just south of twin dams because hosanna was seen in that area this morning and so i'm pretty sure it could have been just on the southern side of the road and that's why we can't find any sign of the kudus either we've done every single road around that area trying to find them and no luck so we're back up towards where we were going to originally start, our original plan of Hukamuri, and obviously Brent is on those tracks on foot, so I'm just looping ahead of him trying to see if I can give them a hand a little bit and try and kind of cut off the sort of areas that we know that he likes to walk and try and get onto those sections and see if we can pick up his tracks anywhere. The problem with him is, as we all know, is he's not a very easy leopard one to track or to follow. tends to move around quite a bit and tends to, as Brent was saying, zigzag. So I just want to check the old hyena den quickly just to see if there's any sign of anything here. So Alan, our, our crickets match that we are going to be having tomorrow will be between the sunrise and sunset safari tomorrow so it shall be in the sort of midday unfortunately it will not be televised cricket game because well we are we are scared to show brent on tv and to see his skills on on cricket might or might be illegal and so you know we don't want to to shock the world with his skill and his determination and exactly and then we've got also an Aussie cricketer amongst us too so it's all kind of something we want to stay away from so we won't be televising this match it's going to be played behind closed doors I'm undoubtedly sure that there will be some videos taken and I'm pretty sure shared during the course of the afternoon safari so that's kind of where we're at with that stuff we're not really using we're not going to show any skills or lack thereof 
of any of the contestants and therefore hopefully everybody will have a good time. But I'm interested uh, to see how Brentley Smith goes. You know, there's lots of talk that has come from Brentley Smith in the last 12 hours as to his uh, cricketing prowess and how he's going to be, you know, winning as the one captain of the one team. And, well, well remains to be seen. Uh, if he gets a duck or is, gets zero, in other words, that's what a duck means, he's going to be uh, not going to hear the end of it anytime soon. And I'm pretty sure if Taylor gets him out, that's going to be even better for me. So we're going to hope that Taylor is able to get Brentley Smith out. That's what I'm hoping for anyway. And maybe we'll then have a good laugh about it in the afternoon. Julie, no, Brent is not an Aussie at all, but Taylor is. So Taylor's dad is Australian and was an Australian cricketer himself and then Taylor actually is Australian has an Australian passport and so she's the Aussie for the match then we've got a couple South Africans we've got a oh actually David you're also a little Aussie in you isn't there yes so David's on the back here has also got a bit of Aussie blood in him so he's going to be an Aussie contingent too and then we've got a bit of United States as well represented in the cricket game that is going to be happening tomorrow and so it's going to be a multicultural affair now here is some trucks of a hyena so we're not going to worry about those let's carry on and see if we maybe can find Hukumuri's track somewhere here oh Sindara you are in the same boat that I'm in and you're saying where is Tumba? You're having withdrawal symptoms, and I agree. It's not ideal that we haven't seen much of Tumba. He was such a kind of regular feature while I was on leave, and then now he's just disappeared. And so I don't actually know where he is. He was last seen on an area called Arethusa Private, so south of Arethusa Airstrip area, and since then he hasn't been called in by anybody. So nobody from Londolosi, Malmala, the West. But that's not really something to worry about because our little Tumba is very good at keeping a low profile and then all of a sudden he just pops up out of nowhere in the middle of your area and you just have no idea how he got there. So I wouldn't, hopefully we'll see him in the next few days, it would be really nice. Although with Hukumuri hanging about it's probably better that he's just staying away at the moment and hopefully he'll kind of find some shelter and then come back at another time when he's a bit bigger and stronger and maybe can compete. Anyway, we'll carry on. We're going to try to see if Hukumuri's walked in in any of the areas he did yesterday. While we do that, let's send you back across to Taylor and hear what her opinion is of Brent's cricketing skills. <sighs> Goodness. Like I said, I'm a bit nervous for this cricket match now tomorrow. Um, it's going to be interesting. Like I said, still standing firm with what I had to say this morning. My money's on Tristan being the best cricketer of, uh, out of a, uh, out of them all. Um, I'm pretty sure Brent is a good cricketer. He's very good at all the sports that he does. He's also, again, he's quite a, a sporty lad. Tristan is also a very sporty lad. We've got many a sporty lad. Conrad as well, our technical genius. That's going to be exciting to watch. Oh, unfortunately, Darby's going on leave, so he won't be able to partake, but I'd imagine that he can uh, bowl a ball. Um, I'm trying to think, who else? Who else in camp plays cricket? I can't think. Uh, I'm going to try my best. I, however, have not played cricket in a very last, long time, and I think the last time I even played car park cricket was in 2015, or maybe early 2016. It has definitely been a while. So tonight, when we get back to camp, I shall be practicing my bowling against a wall and uh, making sure that I can... Oh, I'm stuck. I'm trapped. My camera was on my lap. And um, and make sure that I still know where to place the ball and how to hold it. Tristan's going to have to give me a few lessons. Um, the batting I'm not too worried about. I'm just going to block it because I know Brent's going to bowl really fast, but that's fine. Used to it. I can handle that. And I think we're playing with a tennis ball. <laughs> It's not going to be so. I've been hit with worse. I've got just brothers, so um, I've been hit with a lot worse than uh, than just a tennis ball. I'm not too worried about that. Can come as fast as it needs to. And um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be good fun. I'm pretty sure there'll be lots of videos. Um, I'm just excited to field. I just want to catch the brains. No, that's going to sound terrible. I'm sorry, start thinking. <laughs> Let me reword that very carefully. 
I don't know how else to say it. Anyways, I'm just really excited to catch the guys out in terms of, well, catching the ball. I almost dug myself a deep grave there. Let's reposition on that happy note because um, we've got two lionesses, but we thought we we're going to go off on the prowl. But that was not the case at all. They just came to land the shade. And now I have to go straight back because I've got two mud wallows, one on either side. Oh, I didn't even tell you about Gregory today, our tortoise. Our camp tortoise was very funny. I walked out of my room, and as I walked out of my room, I looked down on the ground, and there was tor tortoise tracks going all the way through camp. But I kid you not, they go to everybody's um, sort of steps. They go one way, and then they zigzag to the next room, to the next room, and I'm going, where's this tortoise? So she was behind the fire pit on her way to the kitchen. <laughs> So I paid Gregory a visit. She climbed up onto my lap. Not even a lie. We'll, there will be videos that I'll get sent to me just now and a picture of her sitting on my lap. I did give her a grape. I gave her a grape. That was naughty of me, but she just she was so desperate for a grape. She loves grapes. Anyways, here's more lines. Hello, lines. I've now lost Floppy Ear, who I suspected was Floppy Ear. Ah, now, it's a pity we can't see the young Nguhuma male. I don't know where he is. He could be just laying flat. Maybe that's him there, but it's on, uh, I don't know. Um, so, Safari, so it is quite, uh, it's, oh, is that him? No, is that a lioness on the far left? Sorry, I'm just trying to find him. Is that him there? Yes, that looks like him. Look at those. He's got whiskers now, a bit long whiskers. I'm not talking about his actual whiskers. I mean that his, his sort of beard that he's got going on in there. So Safari Cell, you can normally start to see a male as young as about six months, sort of with just longer tufts of hair on his chest than the girls. But um, obviously it becomes more and more prominent by about a year. You can, again, you can start to see it. Um, but it's going to take a long time. I mean, they've got very, very scruffy manes. You can just see a little mohawk starting on uh, the sort of between his ears. It's a little baby mohawk. See that darker coloration of hair coming through? Uh, when he gets to about uh, three years old, he'll have uh, a decent mohawkish mane, if you will. And it's going to take well up to about six, seven years old before he develops his mane completely. So he's going to look very scrappy until he gets to about five and a half, six years old. And then he'll start looking like a, a proper male lion. But you can see it fa from fairly young. Just it's very subtle though, of course. They just look hairier than the girls. Now, he's not going to be in this pride for very long. I'm wondering how long the Birminghams are going to tolerate him for, because remember, this is the the first time I think that they've actually sort of had a, a pride of their own, if you will. They were very young, new males coming into this area. So they might let him stay here for a little bit longer, especially as they're spending more and more time away sort of from home, from the Inkuhumas, from the Torchwood Pride, from the Sticks Pride. So I, I typically it's between about... Two and a half to three and a half years that uh, the coalition of males that sees to the prides will, will typically tolerate the youngsters before they get chased off. But again, that that just depends on a number of different things, and uh, we'll just have to wait and see. I'm trying to think. They're they're just they're almost two now, aren't they? Some of them are almost two. So he's still got a little while, of course. Very nice. Hmm. Now, when he disperses, we're not sure where he's going to go. Life obviously is very tough for young males. I mean, it's very tough for them when they start out as cubs. We know that uh, the cats, unfortunately, don't have a very good sort of survival statistic until they reach adulthood. And he's going to have to move off and live in between other lions. So, super bikes, I think that was the the name there apologies if uh, that wasn't it ah that was correct wonderful um <clears throat> he is he's probably going to get a name when or what it's going to be i have absolutely no idea that will of course be a, a discussion on its own at some other point but i don't think we'll name him yet they'll probably name him just before he disperses remember we've got New lions coming into the area, so he also needs to watch out. He needs to be a little bit careful. 
but very sleepy cats. Vera and I were saying just before we got a bit too excited in thinking that these cats were going to get up and on the go. Instead, they've now flopped back down after a drink of water where I reckon they'll probably sleep for a little while longer. Now, here's something I'm not very good at, and it's identifying different lionesses. And um, I know, of course, amber eyes is an easy one to identify. So thank you very much, Nikki, for giving me that answer. Apparently, the oldest uh, lioness in the pride is indeed the one with the injury on her hip. So there we go, soccer dash. I didn't actually know that. But thank you, Nikki. Nikki, I know you've also been working hard on the IDs of the various females. So we need to get back into that. Again, they're all just hiding away. They won't just sit up and look at me for 10 minutes so I can get a good look of look at them again. I'm very hot and bothered. And the flies and things are annoying them every now and then. But I think what we might do is because they've gone fairly flat, they're probably going to have another siesta. I think we might actually move on for a little bit, do a couple of loops and laps, check some watering holes. Maybe we find some elephants. I'm not staring straight into the sun. It's so wonderful. Look at that. Isn't that attractive? It's so nice. Let me try to do that. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> right, so we'll head off from the Inkahumas now, give them a little break, let uh, everyone else come and say hello to them, and then we'll come back a bit later. Off we go to Tristan, who is not having too much luck this afternoon. No, not just yet, but we're still having a nice afternoon. It's a beautiful kind of weather, there's a little breeze blowing, the sun is shining, there's a few birdies around here and there, but it's a very pleasant day, and so... Even though we're not having much luck with finding what we were looking for. Now I'm just listening to an update. Now, hold on a second. Now, I'm just trying to listen to what this update is. Ah, okay. So it's a update for a herd of elephants that's not I thought maybe just maybe they were updating on Hukamuri's tracks and it's not far from where we are so it's just tracks for a herd of elephants that they are talking about but anyway we just kind of still giving it a bit of a chance it's been a hot day you can see with the Nkuhuma pride they're still down they're sleeping they're not really moving too much and I'd imagine our leopards are in a very similar state at the moment and so hopefully what we, if we just patient enough and we keep kind of looping and we just go slowly I'm sure we'll eventually get some sort of semblance of luck or an idea of which way this individual has moved or these individuals have moved so hopefully we'll get a situation where we pick up a good fresh track somewhere what also helps is that you can see the roads are very smooth today and that's because these roads have been graded today so what they've done is they've graded them which basically entails a whole bunch of old tires being tied together and then put onto the back of a tractor and that then gets dragged on the road and the reason they do this is often after rain periods is that we get a situation where we get a lot of kind of erosion and sand gets washed and so when they drag the tires over it just smooths out the surface of the road once again and allows us to be able to drive a little bit more comfortably which is always quite nice and so it doesn't feel like your back and your spine is being jolted every two minutes which is very pleasant and so we can thank Rex for that he was busy on the tractor most of the day even though he's done two walks today so been a busy man but they good when, when this happens it's very good for us because we know that it's pretty much a blank canvas except that it's not the rain blank canvas where it makes it go all crusty and hard now it's all puffy and soft and so you'll have a situation if anything walks across here you're going to pick it up very very quickly so hopefully we'll get lucky and be able to find what we're looking for now while i have a scratch around and check this nicely graded road let's send you back across to taylor who's found herself a feathered friend we have a kingfish and it's just eaten something ah, it got it though it was a it's yeah it's a bit difficult to see it now unfortunately it was a little brown hooded kingfisher I don't know, maybe a little Earthing, which is quite cool that it actually managed to find one because earthworms are not very I'm trying to think how many earthworms I've actually seen. Right, back you go to Tristan because apparently there's lots of Now, Taylor's unfortunately in a place where there's a few little gremlins that are around and so 
she was trying to get across to me, but I think the gremlins took over before. But nice to have a little kingfisher around. I, would, I don't know which kingfisher it was, but you know, these days we're getting fewer and fewer of our woodland kingfisher. Ah, grey headed, nice. Or oh, grey hooded is not the right, is brown hooded, grey headed. So grey headed kingfisher, that's a very nice one to see. It's a very cool bird that we get out here, so that's a nice one to pick up. Well done, Taylor. They're probably somewhere around the Mulawati system because quite a few of them hanging about there. And actually, I remember Ralph telling me that he hasn't seen too many of them until he got here. He was amazed that they are something that you can see here and that he had seen quite a few. So good for him and good for Taylor this afternoon. It's a very pretty little bird that I quite like them as well. So nice to have but they're going to start disappearing and so are the man, uh, woodland kingfisher like I said and so soon we're only going to be left with our brown hooded who have been subdued and quiet and kind of been pushed into the background by the boisterous woodland kingfisher and it'll be nice to kind of see them hanging about again as well but for us it's been very quiet we have seen little to no sign of any animals so no um, impalas, no kudu, no waterbuck, none of that. It's been very, 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 very quiet. And maybe that means that something is lurking and has caused a bit of a disruption. You never know. Maybe that's the case. So I'm trying to scan under every single one of these shady spots and just trying to double check that Hukumuri is not lying in under one of these thickets and taking it very easy in this afternoon heat. But it's starting to get to that time where he should start moving. So I'm hoping that he's going to come for a drink at some point. Now, it's not a bushwalk without Brentleo Smith playing in the sand like a naughty toddler. So let's go across to him and see what he's doing this time. Oh no, sorry about that everybody. Can you believe it? I never thought the day would come where Brent would be silent. What a treat. <laughs> ah, only jokes, of course. And um, also for those of you that worry about our, us teasing one another, we're basically like a big family. Brent's the annoying big brother, as you can imagine in camp. Tristan is like the sensible big brother, but that also likes to tease and prank the older brother that's annoying. Okay. And then I'm just that little gremlin little sister that um, gets away with murder all the time. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how I do it. What's Scotty? I don't know. Sc Scott's like that fun uncle. Hey? Not that he's Scott's old, but he's just like... Uh, Nikki has now said he's like a child. I, I didn't say that. Scott, that's not me. <laughs> Anyways, um, so yes, maybe. But yeah, we're all, we all have a, a lot of fun with one another, as you can imagine. Um, and we tease and we have fun and st I'm just, we're still trying to figure out that Steve though, hey? And Uncle Ralph, Uncle Ralph will be back soon. He, he's, uh, he should be coming back in the next two weeks, so you'll all be excited for that. Uncle Steve got back today and uh, we'll be starting drive tomorrow afternoon. And well, when's James coming back? I don't know when James is coming back. He's coming back. Don't want to go anywhere. We're still all here. I feel like that's important to let you all know that no one is left here we're still having a um, we've obviously moved on from the lines now we're just having a quick scratch around maybe we get to do some birding and uh, we're gonna head towards Buffalo Dam and have a quick look around there right it seems as though Brent has managed to find his voice again let's go see what took it Yes, Taylor, you've never lost your voice, that's for sure. Uh, yes, the very irritating little sister is Taylor McCurdy. So I'm digging in the sand for something we don't see too often on safari. And it sh this should be somewhere here. There we go. That is a 375 solid. That is a bullet. Now, most people get confused when they look at a rifle or when they see a, a, 
around. So basically, this is the bullet. It is the projectile that comes out of the rifle. And um, that is where the round will sit. So that the, the, the casing that holds the powder and the ignition and whatnot all sits underneath it. But that is a 375, probably fired by Rexon or Herbie. Rexon, it was Rex, um, in December. So this is the shooting range uh, here on Juma where the guys practice um, to make sure they, uh, they're still uh, good with the rifle in case we do ever have to. And I don't think we will, but if we, in case we ever have to use a rifle. But there we go. That's a 375 solid. So it's made out of brass mostly. And that is 310 grains. And it comes out of that rifle at about 3,000 feet per second. Now, another reason we stopped here is to answer Dale's question. Dale was wondering how deep does the sand go here. I was assuming you were talking about the, the top layer of sand till you hit a different substrate, Dale. Um, well, it depends on where you are. Uh, up here on the crests, not too far before you get down to the sandstone, sort of quartz soils. So you get down to the quartz soils. So there we go, you can see very loose quartz. So that's how far down, probably about two or three meters. You can see here, this is we're in a quarry now. And Hukumuri's walked straight through the quarry. I'm going to shoot you, Craig. He doesn't look very impressed with me. I shot Craig. Where did it go now, Craig? You've lost it. Where? Am I being blind? Yep. Now stand on it. Ah, there we go. Okay, let's go keep following Hook and Murray's tracks. Should I shoot Craig again? <laughs> you can see him. <laughs> uh, Craig gives me a hard time when we're when we when we're off air. So I got I got to take my opportunities when I can, when while we live and you can't do anything back. Hey Craig. Hey Craigie. Okay, let's go see how my annoying little sister Taylor McCurdy is doing. <laughs> now, here's another interesting relationship in camp. Brent and Craig are like an old married couple. You must hear them, they bicker and then they best friends again, and then they bicker, and then they best friends again. Then Brent does all sorts of things that annoy poor Craig to death, and poor Craig just puts up with it. <laughs> so uh, the camp dynamics are quite entertaining, quite funny. We all have an argument with one another, and then we best friends again two seconds later. It's very dramatic, which is why we're all like siblings with one, uh, one another. Because you know, all of you that have got siblings know how you can fight, and you'd think, goodness, if you fought like that with a friend, you'd probably never want to be friends with them again. But you can't choose family. And when you're with the Wild Earth family, well, we, hope, we welcome you with open arms, but then we also lock the door behind you so you can't escape. <laughs> it's a trap. Right, so Viam and I were just chatting about Tandy and um, he was on camera with Tristan when they last had her. It was around a little bit just further west of us. So we're just having a quick scratch around to see if we can't see anything. I, I don't know where Tristan is because I don't want to be bumbling about where he's driving. Um, I mean, I'm going to be driving all over. We're just going to do a loop here. So I'm, I'm basically going up Drakensberg Road now that goes back up towards uh, sort of Quarry Pan Road and we'll drive on Quarry Pan, we'll check Quarry Pan and then we'll head to Buffelsook Dam. But so far, no tracks on the ground just yet. Now, lots of antelope and things that we're walking around here. Oh, a bit bumpy. She loves to go up and down on this road. Wee. Ha ah. ha ha. Nice, Debbie. Debbie's on a roll today. Just going back to the collective nouns we were talking about with lions and, and getting creative. You said a lion of lions. Very funny. Very entertaining. I like that. Nikki likes that as well. Nikki's now doing an evil laugh. And I don't know how she does it. Her, like, you know, normally people go, ah, ka, 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 ka. Oh, I don't know. Nikki does this interesting one. It's a strange one. It's a little bit eerie. Like, if I heard it at two o'clock in the morning, I'd be frightened. She goes, meh, 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 meh. That's the sound that Nikki makes. <laughs> she does her, her fake laugh. Right. 
Come on, this is the time for leopards to be out on a walkabout to go and get a drink of water. So perhaps I'll just pick up the pace a little bit to get towards Quarry Pan. Might even get some Ellie's. Ooh, right, proud cat mama. You have just asked what or which predator species do I think is more aggressive in terms of being either solitary or social. I think I got that correct. It's a tough one. I, I don't even think it goes down to that. I think it goes down to their personality types. Um, I mean, lions are really social. So again, because they live in groups, maybe they won't react in such a, an aggressive manner because there's many of them. If, even if you go towards buffalo, look at buffalo. Buffalo bull that's in a herd of 200 other buffalo in a breeding herd, calm, relaxed. Maybe we'll snort at you. Buffalo bull that's on its own, terrified for his own life, takes everything very seriously and doesn't like to joke around anymore because he's worried. He's only got his eyes, his ears and one nose to sort of keep him safe. Let's have a look to see if anything's come down here. Um, so, so I think naturally solitary predators will be on a more edge a little bit more. Again, it's, it, there's so many different things. Do they have cubs? Do they have a kill? All these things, of course, come into play. But I, I think I would say that maybe a solitary predator is a little bit more on the aggressive side. Right, you've got a spider web. Whee! Oh, VM just told me that's his spider web. <laughs> Turn <it> back. <laughs> Nothing is drank here at Quarry Pan, so off to the next watering hole we go. Let's go see if um, Brent is actually going to find us a leopard on foot. Okay, guys, welcome where he's been playing with us. His tracks are on top of our tracks. We've just had Squirrel's alarm calling now. So I think he's been trying to avoid us, and we've been sort of dancing around each other all afternoon. Where you want to go, Rex? Yeah. So this is where we think he is. So the Squirrel's are alarming in here. His tracks are on top of our tracks back here coming through. So I'll ask Tristan to come into the area just in case we do spot him. Uh, rather get the vehicle in there. He's much more relaxed with the vehicle. But he's got to learn. We're not going to give up tracking him. just here. Now I'm quite sure he's here. I think it might be better what we do is if we get Tristan to come here in the car uh, and we'll just walk on the edge to see if he is, has moved a bit. But I can hear Tristan coming because I think what's happening is we've been just following him and he just keeps ducking from us the whole time. I mean his footprints were fresh, fresh, fresh on top of ours. And uh, here comes Tristan now. Okay, we're just going to look a little bit more around here while we wait for Tristan. Let's jump on the back with Tristan as he makes his way in here so I can concentrate on what's going on around me. Well, Brenty, good luck there. If, they are the vehicle, if the tracks cross Shabamu going westwards and they're on top of Brent's tracks and they're on top of my tracks, then he has crossed within the last five minutes because I've just come from here. So that's good news. So I'm going to take the fire break. I just want to double check with Brent where exactly he is. I'm trying to just see because I saw Brent just now when he was playing in the sand in the quarry. So I'm trying to see if I can see Brent is and try and work out exactly where he is. Okay, so Brent is saying come past the pan. So he's a little bit further north than I first initially anticipated. But like I say, if these tracks are on top of all the tracks on the road, then he's literally crossed in the last five minutes. So we should be hot on his trail now, which is good news. So that's really good. Now, due west of the pans. Okay, Brent, I'm coming. I'm coming. We're trying to get through here. It's a difficult area to negotiate. and. Hopefully we're going to be able to find 
exactly where Hukumuri has gone. There's a big prominent termite mound just here that I want to just double check if Brent is west of me. There they are. I can see them now. So I can see where Brent and Rex and all of them are. Sorry, Darby. There's a two track that runs here actually from an old shadow sighting. So we had a sighting of shadow here quite a long time ago and she used to hang around in this area quite often. So Brent says he's close by. I can see Brent in front. And I wonder if maybe, just maybe, the squirrels are not alarm calling somewhere around here. I'm going to try and just go forward and just keep checking. This is the termite mound I was talking about just in front here. So Brent is in the same place. But I'm just going to have a quick chat to him. Now, we're going to have a chat to Brenty quickly just to find out what he's saying. We're chasing him, I think, at the moment. So he's just keeping on moving right in front of us. Okay. And um, his last place, we had a sort of brief, brief glimpse was through there. Did you see him? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well done. He's, he's, uh, he's not happy being followed on foot. I think we've chased him around all afternoon. Okay. But cool. We're going to go back to the other parts. Cool. Enjoy, guys. Bye. Thank you. So, Brent says that they had a very brief glimpse of him heading off in this direction, and that is excellent news. So, they've done a sterling effort to be able to find him in this direction. It's obviously a very dense area, and so we're going to have to have our eyes peeled to be able to spot him through all of this and we know with him how he likes to move around so he obviously is just kind of playing a little game today and just doesn't really want anyone to actually notice him now the problem with him is that when he feels like he's not going well can't really kind of get away from you then you have a situation where he will just kind of stop and lie down and settle in the long grass and it becomes really hard to see him so we just got to pay attention i know there's also a massive hole here somewhere from shadow who dug was trying to dig out warthogs and i don't really want to end up in that massive hole so i'm just going to try and go through here as best i can all right here's all these holes that i was talking about that i almost ended up going into with shadow the one time so we're going to bypass these quickly I just got to be careful you can see there's one over there and then there's another one on the other side of that tree that is even deeper now there's a diker did Brent maybe see a diker because that's very close to where Brent and them were but maybe this maybe he's stalking this diker um hmm Okay, well if there's a diker right here, well, I trust that Brent and Rex would have definitely known a leopard from a diker of all the people out here that would know that. So I wonder if he just didn't change course slightly and head a little bit further northwards. Darby, you see anything? No. Ah, B. Wilson, exactly. Is Hukumuri tracking Brent or is Brent tracking Hukumuri? Difficult to say, really. I feel like it's a bit of both at this stage. What's that there, Davi? Is that just dead leaves straight through that gap over there? Looks like dead leaves. Or is he sitting somewhere there? No, those are all dead leaves. So I thought maybe those were... Hmm, I don't know. This is going to be very tough to find him and try and see him we'll try and kind of figure it out while we do that let's send you back across to taylor mccurdy and find out what she's been busy with over the last little bit okay i have to warn you straight away don't panic no need to be alarmed nikki we're going through we're going through a grim patch but i promise you we'll get through this together everybody hold hands now through this dodgy spot but we'll come We made it. Hello, Bubbles Hook Dam. And we're back. There you go. Very short lived. Just trying to get a good spot on the dam wall and we'll have a little look around. Who's shouting now and why is everybody shouting? We also try not drive off of the dam. 
Oh, it's the buffalo weavers making noise. Never mind. We don't need to worry about them. I think they're just shouting at one another in the nest. Don't put that stick there. That's not where I wanted. That's not the colour I ordered. I think that's what's being hap what's happening. Look at that. The little tunnel that they're going in. That's quite cool. Oh, gee, they pushed out. Look like it. Either that or it was testing its wings out. So one of my favourite things about the buffalo weaver's nest, it might not be VM's favourite, um, or anybody that has to go up to some of the big masts and navigate their way through the buffalo weaver's nest, which like to build their nests on the repeaters, and um, is all these little tunnels that they've got, little entrances going in, some real, some fake. All those sticks have got thorns on let me tell you that. I don't know how they go through there without uh, hooking their feathers. I'm sure they must lose an odd feather here and there. They're everywhere and constantly on the go, constantly uh, re-establishing that nest, strengthening it, all those wonderful things. But that's not, of course, the only thing that's down at the dam. We've got our friends, the hippos. There's, a, there's, there's one. Hello. Staring at us in the golden light, not impressed. Oh, there's a little one. Oh, this is a new development. The last time I was here... It wasn't a mother and a baby. Very nice. So new visitors to the dam. Unless I was just so, um, I don't know. I don't know maybe, I, I, you know what, it's actually not impossible that I may have missed this. But the other day I sat here for ages and I couldn't see a, a little hippo. But of course they come and go as we move along. Um, as not as we move along, as the hippos move along. They'll pop into different dams. Now, speaking of full moon, I think we've got full moon tonight, have you? Yeah. Should be tonight, yeah. And, um, El, no, I don't think it causes the animals to hide. I, I've never noticed that before. In fact, it does the other, the complete opposite. It's really quite nice for the herbivore species that want to avoid being eaten by leopards and lions. Because when they stand out in the open, uh, all you have to do is close your eyes really tight for about 30 seconds and open them slowly. And I promise you right now, if there's no clouds out, you'll be able to see relatively well in the dark too. Your eyes adjust amazingly. But their eyes are much better than ours. Even the herbivores probably see better at night than what we do. And will be able to spot the silhouettes of predators trying to creep towards them. Obviously, if you're standing in a thicketed area, I suppose it doesn't matter how much light you've got on you. Because uh, there is always, always, always trees to hide behind. Hello, little mongoose. That's a dwarf mongoose. Just one. Oh, no, there's actually quite a few of them. I think they're all very busy. Doing a last bit of foraging before the sun goes down. Um, it's going to be hard to top my mongoose experience. Here's a young pup. After we had one youngster death feigning and pretending to die in front of a yellow billed hornbill. Must be something delicious in there. Maybe they're trying to dig out scorpions. That would be a great, great spot for a scorpion to dig its burrow on the side of the bank. And mongoose of all different ages. Okay, see that? Checking all those burrows. Maybe even lizards. Lots of skinks and things would live in burrows like that too. Hard at work putting their nose in the dirt. And they've got very, very sharp claws. They're very good diggers. That's quite nice to see, in fact. Now, you can see that there's some wire there. There's some mesh. That is a gabion, and often we put gabions in. We, we'd see them quite a bit in the Mara. These are young young mongoose pups here. Um, what, what they do do, careful, is they take this big mesh. They pack it with quite large rocks and make it sort of into like a square or rectangular shape, and they use it as a reinforcement, often to try and stop erosion or to support banks and bridges and things like that. So it's something that you learn to make uh, when you're training as a guide. It's not just conservation management. This is something that we are taught as well. And well, the mongoose are enjoying it because I bet that there's lots of lots of little things living in between those crevices of the rocks and just wide enough that they're able to sneak on in. So don't worry, that fence is not going to affect those mongoose. They're very small, and they can quite easily go in between that, that sort of mesh. They're very busy. I wonder where they're living. Oh, there's a virtual starling. You often see the virtual starlings in and amongst um, the hornbills. Are you chasing them? Let's see what's going on here. Please, oh, and there's a yellow-billed hornbill. So, oh, that virtual starling has been quite nasty. Now... 
I don't know if it's trying to steal insects away from the mongoose. Perhaps that's why, it, as it sees one, it's trying to chase or intimidate one of those mongoose and see if it's going back for revenge so that it can claim its stake. All of you, I bet, remember good old Sir David Attenborough. I uh, can't remember. I think it was Africa where the forktail drongo is with the meerkats and doing the alarm call like the meerkats so that they run away. But only does the, the alarm call of the meerkat when they have something like a scorpion or an insect of sorts because then they run away. Then they don't care about food and the bird will swoop on in and steal it. They're quite clever. So maybe this virtual starling is trying the same sort of tactic. It is. It's squawking. Every time it goes in, it goes... So if you said that you love these little mongoose, me too. We all do. My favorite thing in the whole world to do is actually to get out the car and sit on the ground uh, near a mound of theirs and then watch them come out eventually. If you sit very still and you stay very quiet, they'll move around you. These birds are very busy. <laughs> Eloise, I think I'm very lucky in having the most bizarre sightings. Like I said, I'm okay with not having say maybe the best lion or leopard sightings or watching them catch things all the time. I, however, thrive over the small, interesting encounters uh, that we, we have out in the bush, ones that, you know, I'm going to be able to tell stories of that people maybe have never seen before. So watching a dwarf mongoose death feign for entertainment, because that's purely what it was, that Hornbill was never going to attack um, those mongoose, and, and I th they live closely with one another. You often see yellow-billed Hornbills. It was just like it was looking for a, re a reaction um, from seeing the mating gerbils, very interesting sighting. Learned a lot about them that evening. Uh, one of the great ones have I had. I had... Uh, I'm trying to think now. VM? The s you know? Sorry, I got excited then. I used my hands too much. VM and I, that best sighting I've ever had in my entire life was the serval with the hyenas hissing and snarling at them and then eating off of their kill. That was really cool. VM was on camera with me with that. And I think I only spoke about it about a thousand times while I was in the Mara. Well, here we go, a thousand and one, because that was a good year as well. I do. I have some really great sightings. What else do we have at the dam? There are lots and lots of creatures here. Do you think, I don't know if we can get close to those mongoose, because that's where the Bermuda Triangle is. There we go. Some Egyptian geese. Also just at the dam. Who else have we got? We've... The blacksmith lapwings there. Always the blacksmith lapwings. Moving around the edge of the dam. No little three-banded plovers annoying them today? No? Doesn't seem that way. They're just carrying about, walking along the edge of the water, um, eating insects. Perhaps they're going to go and harass Mr. and Mrs. Egyptian Goose. It looks like there's four of them plotting their attack. No, they're not plotting their attack. They're just relaxing and enjoying themselves. I'm trying to work out where those mongoose are living. There must be a termite mound somewhere there, somewhere close by. You know, there's a, that's a red-billed hornbill now, another bird species joining the party. Run, run, run. Very vulnerable for them to be out in the open as well. They need to be careful. Ah. <laughs> Weedy, you said the mating tortoises. Yes, that was actually on the damn wall. I, I've had actually had many mating tortoise sightings, but the one that I was referring at was when we are looking at Egyptian geese, where we are now. And then the next minute, out of the corner of the screen, came mating tortoises. The female speaks sent tortoises with desperate away from the male. That was quite funny, too. Some I've had some crackers. I um, I really am... I continue. I really do. Egyptian and the, the crowned cranes versus the juvenile python in the marsh in the Mara. That was epic. The crowned cranes almost fighting to the death. That was amazing. I mean, that changed my imp opinion completely. What about the water scorpion launching itself out of the water trying to catch a frog? That was also in the Mara. That was epic. That was really cool. Did it get something? No, it didn't. I thought it had a little insect in its mouth, but and sadly, it didn't have a little insect. They're actually using those, the donga quite well. Oh, no, don't, please don't give me another awkward sighting, mongoose. That was so close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, this is saying about the wild dog update, but sadly still in Buffelsuk, but they might come this way for tomorrow. Look at them. Really, really making the most of climbing around in between those little crevices. So, like I said, scorpions, lizards, millipedes, solifuges taking refuge up in those rocks. Be a number of different little creatures living in there. Right, we're going to move away from Bifflesook Dam. I think we'll start making our way back towards those lions to see what they're up to. Or if we go back to Tristan, who doesn't seem to be having much luck with leopards. No, not much luck at all, and we couldn't find anything further. It was quiet. We stopped. We switched off. We listened. We tried everything. We checked termite mounds, but I don't see any sign of him anywhere. I can't hear him, like I say, any sort of audio for him. And in this long grass, what he might have done is just lay right down, boom. And then to spot him, you've got to literally drive on top of him. So what I'm doing now is just trying to do loops around the area and hope that exactly like what's happened with Brent, him kind of overlapping and coming back and those kind of things is how we're going to be able to pick him up and see him again but that's the idea anyway whether or not we get it right is going to be anyone's guess at this stage this hukumuri fellow is another story when it comes to trying to follow him it's nice when you find him stationary on a termite mound or something like that but when he decides that he wants to go he really is a handful to keep up with so hopefully he's just going to decide just decides to kind of pop out somewhere so Nikki in final control is saying the other morning that we spent with him was ridiculous to witness how much he can move and how quickly he covers distance and the changes in direction that he has and that's the hardest part with him it doesn't matter if a leopard moves fast or any sort of thing like that it, you, you know you don't mind when leopards move quickly or slowly it doesn't that doesn't really matter it's more that the fact that he just doesn't stick on a direction it's one minute he's north then he's south then he's east then he's west then he's back north again and it just makes it really tough to predict where he's going to come out a lot of the time when we're tracking leopard and we're trying to find leopards it's not actually a lot of the time about following footprint for footprint. You generally try and predict, okay, where is this animal going to end up? I think it's going to go in this kind of direction. And so that's how we normally try and follow tracks is it makes it much quicker and it makes it much easier to follow. But with him, it's almost like you can't do that. You've almost got to do kind of big loops around and just hope that he either his track comes out somewhere or you've got to kind of walk on him track for track, which is... A seriously difficult skill and not many people can do that not many people have that ability to, to get onto a track and track it through thickets like this I mean it's you know he's walking through long grass he's walking through areas that are very difficult to I thought I heard in a Franklin alarm call that's why we just came to an abrupt stop but it's gone quiet now No. It's quiet, so if it was a Franklin alarm calling for a leopard, you would hear lots and lots of calling and lots of making of noise, and that's very, very quiet. So it's just a probably a little contact call that happened, and that was it. All right, come on, Hukumuri. I know you're going to pop out for us at some point. we just got to be patient. That's all it is. There's, leopards really know how to test your patience, that's for sure. So Tulan, who's five years old, hello Tulan, nice to hear from you again. I haven't heard from you in a few days, so always good when, I can, when we get a question from you. And you want to know if it, I think that the animals know that it's almost Easter time. Well, yes, Tulan, I think they do. I think that you'll have a situation where the scrub hares are all gathering their eggs to try and give all of the animals a little chocolate Easter egg from well, just to celebrate Easter. But in, in reality, no, they don't really know it's Easter, actually. I wish that they did. Wouldn't it be fun if all the animals had a day where they didn't chase each other and they all had Easter eggs and they kind of set them out and they went and found Easter eggs together? Wouldn't that, that would be cool? And we would help them and then it would be quite fun. But they don't, unfortunately, know what Easter is and they just go about their business the exact same way that they would any other day, which is... a I'm not going to lie, I'm not very jealous of that because we are lucky we get to have little chocolate Easter eggs and we are able to kind of feed on those things and David in the back here, Tulan, he loves chocolate 
Easter eggs. Yes, he's saying, oh yes. And so he is going, he would be very sad if he was an animal and he wasn't allowed to eat Easter eggs. So he's happy that he's a human and that he can find Easter eggs for himself. Yeah, Hukumuri, come on now. So, given that we want it to be Easter, Hukumuri needs to now show himself because we need to be able to see him moving around somewhere in this area. I'm just throwing it out there, it's the universe. You've got to go sometimes just have a little kind of chat with the animals while you're driving. Tell them that this is not on, that they are not allowed to hide in these thickets like this, and that they need to come out onto the road. and. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes they listen if you throw it out there. You've just got to put the positive vibes out and then you've got to kind of uh, try and sort of make them listen. And that's what we're going to do now because otherwise I'm not sure we're going to find Hukumuri in amongst this nonsense that is this block to our west and east actually, funny enough. Now ten. <laughs> Taylor, what have we learnt about today? Because Taylor McCurdy is having a little chip and saying that I'm going to have a 9 out of 10 day too early and that I shouldn't have said it and I should have waited until the end. And Taylor, you must remember that today has not been your friend. It's, you've had coffee in the eye, you've had a flat tire, so you mustn't give trouble to others. And I can still have a 9 out of 10 day. What happens if I find a pangolin now? Then it will be a 10 out of 10 day. So there's room for brilliance as they say on the cricket field often we used to say we have to leave room for brilliance and try and find a way to pull it out of the bag otherwise I'm going to get an award that we used to get in cricket called a TFC award now if you played a cricket game and you got the TFC award TFC basically stands for thanks for coming and that was because you were a person that came down to the game and there was thanks given that you came down because you filled the quota of numbers but you did absolutely nothing and therefore were pretty useless on the day and so there was that was the one award and if you were really bad and you didn't even field you didn't really get any runs or anything like that then you would get ATU which was also turned up so it's not an award we want for the day we don't want to get the TFC or ATU award we want to try and get some sort of other award and so while we can't try and figure it out let's send you to Brent and find out if he did indeed see a leopard or was it a diker Very, very funny, Tristan. Very funny. Now, maybe we should stop helping, Tristan. Uh, we're still very close to that, that area, and what we've done is we've just sat quietly, and we're listening to see if we can pick up any other alarm calls that might give us a hint to which way hukumuri has gone from where we last spotted him, Tristan. But so far... Very, very quiet here. Yeah. Lots of lovely bird sounds. But I think, um, speaking of the TFC award, I think Tristan might get it for this afternoon's drive. <laughs> now, tomorrow morning, the cricket is going to get very serious. I wonder who is going to be man of the match and who is going to get the TFC award. Now, we've sat here for about 10 minutes and we haven't heard anything. So, we're going to move again. He is a sneaky leopard, old Hukumuri. Okay, let's get going again. Away from Treehouse Waterhole. So, a lot of you are wondering about the little prince, Hasana. Uh, he was seen happy and healthy and scar-free this morning on Little Gauri near the Chitwa boundary, but he uh, didn't come into Chitwa, so he's... He, he, he made good his escape yesterday.